I hope my screen is visible. Yes, sir. Well, uh, uh, good afternoon, or probably good evening to everyone. Um, today I've been asked to cover two important topics and early undifferentiated arthritis and, and Sjogren syndrome. Two Hello, topics. Sir. Yeah. sir, can you make it full screen, sir? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I'm sorry. Is it full screen now? Yes. I thought it was full screen. Yeah. Yes. Is it okay? Yes. Yeah. Right. So um, I've been asked to uh, basically talk about two important topics. That is, one is an early undifferentiated arthritis and Sjogren syndrome. Two, uh, probably uh, quite, uh, I won't say debilitating, but quite problematic issues, which are quite common in a medical OPD and uh, which is often overseen. Uh, as probably just myalgia or fibromyalgia or just weak joint pains. So I've divided my talk broadly into the early undifferentiated arthritis and the Sjogren syndrome. Though both are two different entities, there are some similarities between both of them. So I'll start off with early undifferentiated arthritis by what are the definitions of what you mean by an undifferentiated arthritis and what you mean by early um, and undifferentiated arthritis. So what do you mean by undifferentiated arthritis? It's basically an inflammatory form of arthritis. So whenever we say inflammatory, the predominant questions that uh, you should ask the patient. Uh, patients. Are, hello? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm, I'm there, yeah, sure. So um, the predominant form of arthritis that um, have to be, ought to be asked to the patients are whether they have pain, swelling, and they have, whether the pain is more in the early morning hours. And that basically, gives that inflammatory nature of the pain and early morning stiffness lasting for more than 30 minutes. So in a, in a patient who presses with all these three things, that is joint pain, swelling and stiffness, but who cannot be classified into any of the specific rheumatological disorders are basically put, at, put under this broad term called undifferentiated arthritis. Actually, there was, a, there was a paper which said that most of the diagnosis of undifferentiated arthritis comes from rheumatology clinics. That's probably ought to be due to the increased use of classification criteria to put patients into the various specific rheumatological disorders in order to put them into trials in, in the Western countries. Now, if you have a patient with any of these things, these patients can be put as an undifferentiated arthritis. That is a patient presenting with any of the early manifestations of a defined arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis can overlap between two or more uh, rheumatic diseases, particularly in, in the pediatric age group, uh, when they satisfy two or more criteria of any of the arthritis, they're basically called undifferentiated. And if they, the patient presents with a self-limited syndrome of unknown cause that resolves on its own, again, it's called as an undifferentiated arthritis. So it's a diagnosis of exclusion. Before you tag a patient as an undifferentiated arthritis, a thorough workup has to be done to rule out other causes of inflammatory arthritis and then tag the patient as an un undifferentiated arthritis. Also, we don't have a classification criteria for undifferentiated arthritis. Now, the second, the, uh, the, the prefix to that, the early part, what do you mean by early? Now, this is basically, there is a lot of debate going on on what is an early inflammatory arthritis. So far, what has been applied to many of the early rheumatoid arthritis or, or the early inflammatory arthritis cohorts or the very arthri early arthritis cohorts are these definitions of early arthritis with sim is symptom onset of less than 12 months and very early arthritis is when you have symptom onset within three months of presentation. Uh, six weeks is basically what we need for the patient to satisfy the criteria for um, rheumatoid arthritis. So that is why they have given another six weeks and they've called these patients very early arthritis and to 12 months early arthritis. Certain bodies also say earlier they have clubbed both these things and they've put it as early arthritis just for any patient with symptom onset of less than six months also. Now, what, when do we decide that this patient has arthritis? It, generally refers to synovitis that is detected by physical examination. So if on physical examination, you find that the patient has synovitis, then you can tag them as um, an arthritis or early inflammatory arthritis. Uh, 
So um, why is it very important to diagnose uh, this particular entity? So what has been found in, in several studies is basically that the longer the symptoms of arthritis exist, it's more likely that sufficient characteristics are uh, come into uh, the patient that he ultimately will satisfy one of the other criteria. So what is the problem with that? So this is the general evolution and certain standard trials. Uh, 45 to 55% of the patients do achieve spontaneous remission. And somewhere between 30 and 32, I won't say 32 as an exact figure, 30 to 35% of the patients do develop rheumatoid arthritis, usually within the next one year. So that is why the concept and that is why it's very important to recognize this particular subset of patients because it brings in the concept of window of opportunity. The faster you treat the patient or the more aggressive you treat the patient at this particular juncture, you can actually avoid the patient going into any of or differentiating into any of the known rheumatological conditions. So uh, is there any difference between undifferentiated arthritis and a very common arthritis which we see in a daily OPD like rheumatoid? So what they've found is patients with undifferentiated arthritis, the epidemiology is quite different. They are younger, uh, probably by five or six years. Female, they, they, the female preponderance is less seen in patients with undifferentiated arthritis. If you see the figures in, in certain cohorts where about somewhere between 58% of undifferentiated arthritis to 66% of rheumatoid arthritis. Again, examination wise, you see it, there are certain differences. Sir, it's not audible now. No. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, probably. 
let me this next to you. Um, you just um, you can... Hello. Yeah. Can I? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. You are audible. audible? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so the uh, the other thing that is um, that is spontaneous remission also is much more in this particular entity called as undifferentiated arthritis rather than and in rheumatoid arthritis. And that is why it's it's very necessary. It's quite, you have to diagnose undifferentiated arthritis earlier when the patient comes to us in our general OP. So um, if I may, I'll, uh, there are certain risk factors which this is an idea that this particular patient with undifferentiated arthritis may progress to a rheumatoid arthritis. And they are uh, older age, symptom duration of more than 12 weeks. If the patient comes with a symptom duration of more than 12 weeks, there's a possibility that he may progress to rheumatoid arthritis. Women have a, a almost two-fold greater chance of developing rheumatoid. And particularly if they press him with a very high CRP or probably of more than 50 milligram per liter, uh, there is a chance of five times increased risk of being in an early stage of rheumatoid arthritis rather than just undifferentiated arthritis. Also, if you calculate their disease activity scores like uh, DAS 28 CRP or uh, C di or an S di, you see that these patients, all these are basically hinters that you have here a patient who is not exactly an inflammatory arthritis, just an inflammatory or an undifferentiated inflammatory arthritis. He may progress, he or she may progress to a rheumatoid arthritis probably in a year's time. The other thing is if the patient has multiple joint, like I showed you in the previous slide, Patients with undifferentiated arthritis often have, um, it's an asymmetrical arthritis, often oligoarticular. But if you have a patient presenting with a polyarthritis, again, there's a 1.5 times higher chance of fulfilling a rheumatoid arthritis criteria compared to those patients with monoarthritis or oligoarthritis. Again, if the patient has arthritis of the heart, of their hands, aqua positivity, particularly if he or she is a smoker, and quite often if they are is smoking with the association of HLA DRB1 uh, allele positivity. These are all risk factors for progression of rheumatoid arthritis. So, um, what do you do? You have a patient who is sitting in front of you and you've diagnosed undifferentiated, early undifferentiated arthritis in this patient. How do you approach such a patient? So, uh, various schools of thought, certain people want to treat with NSAIDs. There are RCTs which have given injectable intramuscular methylprednisolone injections to landmark trials. One is a SAVE trial and the Stevia trial, wherein they've uh, given just a single, in the SAVE trial, they've given a single intramuscular injection of methylprednisolone, 120 milligram. They followed up the patient for 52 weeks and they found no effect from the placebo. In Stiva, uh, also they gave 80 milligram methylprednisolone injections and their patients were followed up uh, for six and 12 months. Here, three injections were given and they found that uh, the patients needed uh, um, about 61% at six months and 76% had started DMARCs just with um, steroids. So uh, it came to the conclusion that steroids alone wasn't sufficient in this particular people. So what else? Do you start on a second-line agent? If you start on a second-line agent, which one do you start the patient on? Do you start the patient on a methotrexate? Or is it just HCQ that is enough for these patients? Or do you have to give uh, sulfasalazine or lefonamide? So there comes a prompt trial for methotrexate. And then they went one step ahead by giving abatacept to these patients. And uh, then further giving a TNFI-like inflexible. 
meta-analysis which uh, came out in 2018 wherein they looked at all these various uh, cities and they found that the only drug which had a particular effect on this particular subset of patient was methotrexate. So it had reported beneficial in uh, undifferentiated inflammatory arthritis. It was associated with delayed progression in rheumatoid and a reduction in the rate of joint destruction. Now, these, this effect was much more in patients who have ACPA positive rather than who are, who are ACPA negative. So is this enough? You just start the patient on methotrexate and we are all right actually not so on long-term studies what they found is that patients with, with on despite being treatment of methotrexate you are um, when you discontinue the treatment the rate of progression to rheumatoid was almost similar to that of the placebo one so it means that these patients have to be treated with methotrexate probably methotrexate alone for a long period of time and probably at some jump to a rheumatoid who develops erosions, deformities, etc., and that is why picking up this particular subset of patients and treating them early is uh, is very important in uh, our routine practice. So, the other thing is that they did could we prevent not many treating patients with did delay the development of rheumatoid to twelve months, and um, by Trials will have shown that by about 30 months to 60 months, these results become delays the onset of chronic arthritis and probably even the damage. And that is what we want if we get better therapies for the treatment of these particular agents. So uh, that was about uh, inflammatory arthritis. If uh, any doubts are there, uh, I can take them. If anyone has any doubts, you can drop it in the chat box. I'm so sorry. I think my um, connection is a little bad today. Um, am I audible? Am, am I there? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, you're audible, sir. Yeah. We can see sorry. your slides. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. So just going to the next part of um, uh, the, the talk would be that on Sjogren's syndrome. So this is again a particular uh, part of the, uh, again, a particular arthritis, which is quite neglected and often under diagnosed, uh, I would say. So uh, what do you mean by Sjogren's syndrome? Um, yeah, so Sjogren's syndrome is a chronic autoimmune disease, which is characterized by lymphocytic infiltration of the exocrine glands, particularly the salivary and the lacrimal glands. These patients complain of significant sicker symptoms, dryness of the eyes, dryness of the mouth, and you have circulating autoantibodies in this particular subset of patients. So it's basically defined as a triad of dry eyes, dry mouth, and evidence of an autoimmune process mediating these and other clinical manifestations. So uh, what is the epidemiology? It's um, There's a stark female to male uh, ratio of about 10 is to 1 or even higher age group being about 40 to 60 years of age, but it does affect children and the elderly people. We do have children in our uh, hospital who have been diagnosed to have Sjogren's syndrome being followed up under pediatric rheumatology. Uh, 
uh, there is also a predilection for women in the premenopausal and the postmenopausal age also to develop in the perimenopausal and the postmenopausal age to develop Sjogren's syndrome. Now, broadly, Sjogren's can be divided into two. You can divide them into primary when it's not associated with anything else or when it's a secondary when it's associated with other autoimmune diseases like um, in lupus, about 7 to 25 percent of the patients do have secondary Sjogren's rheumatoid 9 to 14 percent and other conditions like celiac disease, thyroiditis, autoimmune hepatitis and primary periodic cirrhosis. I've only um, given you, uh, which are, I've only shown the significant associations with Sjogren's syndrome, but any particular rheumato uh, rheumatological condition can coexist with Sjogren's syndrome. So um, I'll just put in the pathogenesis in a nutshell because pathogenesis itself is a, is a separate topic altogether. But if you ought to know what it, like any other rheumatological condition, you need a genetically susceptible individual. You need a trigger. Now, both these things, which are the exact genes which are involved in the uh, Sjogren's process, the several genes have been implicated. And what is the exact trigger? Is it a viral trigger? Is it some drug? So several implications, several uh, hypotheses have been put forward. But what we do know is there's what it triggers is and in both the innate and the adaptive immune system is basically triggered over here. The innate immune mechanisms being autoimmune epithelitis, which is seen, followed by which there's activation of the plasmacytic dendritic cells, the natural killer cells leading to formation of interferon and which drives the process in um, Sjogren's syndrome. Also, the other arm being this production of what is known as a BAF, which is a B-cell um, stimulator. So it basically attaches itself to the, the BAF receptors and again stimulates the production of um, uh, and activate several downstream processes, but and activating the autoimmune process, sustaining the response as I've shown in the diagram. Other players in Sjogren's syndrome are the TH17 cells, the T follicular helper cells, as well as interleukin 21. All these are other implications which are there. So what it results is basically there is formation of a germinal center and that to an ectopic germinal center, which results in pro, from an generation of and even augmentation of immune complexes, antibody production, Ultimately, there's lymphoblastogenesis, et cetera, occurring. And it, the cycle just goes on and on and on. So what does this lead to? The clinical features, and this is quite important. The clinical features are broadly divided into glandular involvement and extra glandular involvement. The glandular involvement being um, ocular manifestations. You have the patients presenting classically with dry eye symptoms, a very um, typical history that the patient complains is a burning sensation in the eyes, itchiness in the eyes, needing to rub their eyes very frequently, foreign body sensation, stinging, soreness, photophobia, and a lack of tears. Now, these symptoms can be exacerbated by air drafts, low humidity, reading, and viewing a computer monitor. So um, these history have to be elicited from the patient when you are, if you are suspecting Sjogren's syndrome. Now, the thing is, um, these symptoms correlate very poorly with objective signs of dry eyes, which I'll come to in a few slides. Now, the other ocular manifestations occur basically as a result of orbital and accessory lacrimal gland involvement. Due to the progressive periductal lymphocytic infiltration, you do get dactrocystitis, dactroretinitis. You can have enlargement, just asymptomatic enlargement of the lacrimal gland as well. What happens is a conjunctiva. There is um, squamous metaplasia, there's loss of the goblet cells, cornea, there's thinning of the cornea. And sometimes to the extreme form, there are strands of devitalized cells which are found on the cornea. Mebovian gland dysfunction is seen and all these things ultimately can lead to recurrent uh, bacterial conjunctivitis, corneal abrasions and ulcerations. So these are some of the common ocular manifestations which are encountered in patients with um, Sjogren's syndrome. What about the oral manifestations? And I had shown this similar tongue earlier also. And this is a very classical picture of how a patient of Sjogren's, a typical Sjogren's present to you with. They come to you with a burning sensation of their tongue, uh, difficulty chewing and swallowing, particularly dry foods of like rotis, speaking at a length for which they have to uh, keep drinking water and even difficulty wearing dentures, impaired thirst, Thickened saliva, 
dry lips and this classical picture of the tongue wherein you have a very fissured tongue the dorsal of the tongue is is quite fissured and probably you can have balding also the papillae also will be lost in this particular thing how do you elicit a dryness a very simple thing ask a patient to pull the tongue up or and you just look at the intralingual salivary pooling now this is basically very classical of ocular sicker symptoms now uh, salivary gland enlargement if we think of sugarins the first thing that comes to us is that enlarged patrid glands now mind you this particular uh, manifestation is only seen in about 30% of the patient and um, what you are seeing is you see a symmetric non tender swelling of the major salivary glands and that is a very classical picture of uh, sjogren's syndrome they are generally asymptomatic but if a patient with sjogren's syndrome complains of pain if it's an acute pain then we have to suspect an associated bacterial infection and another thing is if there is an asymmetrical enlargement or the gland becomes hard then you have to suspect glandular lymphoma particularly when asymmetric other exocrine gland involvement are you have nasal passages resulting in mental obstruction a hoarseness of voice basically as an involvement of the larynx a dry hacking cough can occur basically because of the zero trachea which occurs dyspareunia is very common among our patients and pruritus of the skin again that is a very troublesome problem which these patients complain with going forward so those were the glandular manifestations so uh, things which once you have elicited symptoms of glandular manifestations the next thing that you have to ask for is basically the extra glandular manifestations and when you're talking about the extra glandular manifestations you are talking about um, constitutional symptoms like fatigue arthralgia which are quite distressing um arthritis and it could be any organ which are being involved predominantly involving the skin wherein you have features of subacute cutaneous lupus or annular erythema like pattern which i'll come to you uh, in a few, few slides but if i may the most commonest of the constitutional most commonest extra glandular manifestation which these patients will complain to you of is a persistent fatigue a very irritable a very debilitating fatigue which is often seen in about 70% of the patients with with shogans they have widespread joint and muscle pain and they have also cognitive symptoms is also quite dysfunction is also quite quite common among these patients they give a subjective memory loss and difficulty concentrating so often the patient mentions it as a fog in the brain so they complain as a brain fog i'm not able to think classically so these are some of the features of uh, sjogren's syndrome that these patients present with um again none of these uh, constitution symptoms or the extra glandular manifestation con they correlate with any of the antibodies which are there currently for sjogren's renots is a very classical symptom seen in about 10 to 33% of the patients cutaneous manifestations um what the current picture is basically that of an urticaria which is there and this i think some of you have seen in the medicine opd when a patient presents with a palpable purpura particularly in the shin area um these are small vessel vasculopathies and quite common in patients with shogans uh it could be urticarial lesions they can also present with livedoid uh, um livedoid rashes they can have sele subacute cutaneous lupus like lesions can also present or even just papular insect bite like erythema may be there other other cutaneous manifestations which is often seen as angular keloides and eyelid dermatitis and these are the other things that often the patient complains of now um, other things that um, certain other associated sjogren syndrome like skin lesions are paniculitis paniculitis is a little rare in patients with sjogren syndrome but we shouldn't um, miss out on a diagnosis of paniculitis in a patient with sjogren's primary nodular cutaneous amyloidosis is again another important lesion which is quite important in these patients let's go on to um the articular involvement um there there are articular involvement is often seen in about 45% of patients with sjogren's polyarthralgia is often the commonest complaint but these patients will also do complain of a non erosive symmetric inflammatory polyarthritis particularly involving the fingers wrists and the ankles 
and often such polyarthralgia or polyarthritis precede the diagnosis of primary Sjogren's in one third. And that is where our previous lecture on our previous uh, few slides on early inflammatory arthritis uh, comes in. Lung involvement is seen in about 11% of patients. And quite interestingly, there are certain typical features which are seen in patients with Sjogren's syndrome, particularly these very cystic lesions in the lung, which are called as, uh, but which is a pattern of interstitial lung disease called as the lymphocytic interstitial pneumonitis, the LIP pattern. However, the commonest part, pattern that we see in patients with uh, Sjogren's syndrome is often a non-specific interstitial pneumonitis. Other than for which these patients do also complain of zero trachea, zero bronchitis, bronchiolitis, as well as small airway dysfunction is also quite common in such patients. The renal involvement being um, tubular interstitial nephritis, type one renal tubular acidosis, a very, very important uh, condition to be suspected when you have a patient with Sjogren's presenting with osteomalacia. Type one renal tubular acidosis is very common or even who presents with hypokalemia. Glomerular nephritis is quite rare, but again, uh, seen and should be considered in patients who have proteinuria and can also present with nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Gastrointestinal involvement again is due to the dryness that these patients complain of dysphagia and heartburn as a result of um, dryness which are, of the secretions and uh, the dysmotility which occurs in the esophagus. The other things that are seen as uh, chronic active uh, gastritis can also occur in some of these, these patients. Also, um, neurological involvement, depression, like I said, uh, cognitive disturbances are seen in often one third of the patients. And it's very important that we do um, elicit history of such cognitive disturbances or depressive episodes in such patients. Another very um, quite characteristic and quite, again, um, Difficult to treat um, problem in such patients with Sjogren's is often a peripheral neuropathy. 20% of these patients do present with peripheral neuropathy, and often it's a pure sensory neuropathy that these patients complain of. So um, that was just an overview of um, the glandular and the extra glandular manifestations that these patients present. Now, when a patient sitting in front of you with all these things, and you have you are suspecting Sjogren's at that very instant, you have to also assess the risk of lymphoma in such patients because patients with Sjogren's syndrome are at a very high risk for non-Hodgkin's B-cell lymphoma, particularly the marginal zone lymphoma or even the maltoma, which is often seen in such patients. The cumulative risk is much higher than that what you see in, in lupus or in rheumatoid arthritis with a 15-year uh, risk of after diagnosis being about 9.8%. Certain risk factors are very catchy. I already told you about one. One is a parotid gland enlargement, particularly if you have a hard parotid gland, very high titers of rheumatoid factor, a drop in the complements or a low complement at presentation, cryoglobinemia, lymphopenia, and also very high disease acuity, particularly what will come to ESS die in a few minutes. Other things which are not very classical, but have been reported in certain studies have been the presence of neutropenia as palpable purpura, and also um, uh, apps, uh, SSA, SSB antibodies, or Rho and La antibodies, which were positive for some patients become negative um, when they develop lymphoma. So these are other things to be kept in mind when you're approaching a patient uh, with Sjogren's and lymphoma. Now, is it very simple to make a diagnosis of Sjogren's? Probably not, because there are a humpteen number of differentials which you have to consider um, when you have a patient which presents with just these sicker symptoms. So uh, there are a large, uh, large amount of differentials. So certain differentials which I would like to touch upon is, is basically um, what would cause a bilateral salivary gland involvement like viral infections and uh, autoimmune causes, particularly IgG4 diseases and cumorous disease probably, alcoholism, liver diseases, as well as sarcoidosis, which is very, very important. So um, before I go to those conditions, can it all be just an age-related sinker syndrome? Probably yes. And this particular thing is, is you have to take into account particularly when you have an elderly patient sitting in front of you who complains of sicker symptoms. Now, when what are the difference between an age-related sicker and what you see in Sjogren's syndrome? The evidence of systemic disease, 
histological changes in the salivary glands as well as Sjogren's syndrome related antibodies are characteristically absent in these patients with age related sickle symptoms. There is a decline in the tear and unstimulated salivary production as age progresses and also you can have histological alterations in the lacrimal and salivary glands. You can have SNR atrophy, interstitial fibrosis, and ductal dilatation. So, so that is why um, you have to reconsider if you have a patient with age related, with an elderly patient sitting with sicker symptoms, you have to think twice before diagnosing Sjogren's syndrome in this particular patient. The other important differentials would be sarcoidosis, where you have pateric gland enlargement in about four to six percent of the patients, lacrimal gland involvement in about five to sixteen percent of the patients, hepatitis C, HIV infections, particularly DILS, the diffuse the uh, wherein you have a CD8 lymphocytosis syndrome, which you see in 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 these patients. There are very classical differences between DILS and um, Sjogren syndrome, where you see uh, between the onset, but Sjogren syndrome is often a very chronic pathology, whereas the other one is acute. It's quite painful in which where you in DILS basically. The other things is you have you see that um, HIV you you have a CD8 in DILS you have a CD8 predominance which is seen, whereas in Sjogren syndrome there is a CD4 predominance which occurs. So telltale evidence is which basically distinguishes DILS from Sjogren syndrome. And of this particular entity, which is quite uh, an interesting entity and which we are picking up quite often in our OPDs uh, is IgG4 disease. Um, again, IgG4 uh, can also infiltrate the lacrimal and the salivary glands. How do you establish is basically by biopsy, wherein you have these three classical biopsy features, which we not you get permutation and combinations of them a dense lymphocytic and plasmacytic infiltrate, which is a necessity, storiform fibrosis, which is a little uncommon, and obliterative phlebitis also seen in the biopsy samples of patients with IgG4 disease. Now, IgG4 commonly involves the submandibular cerebral glands, and that is some of the common organs to be involved. Now, if you look at the difference between IgG4 disease and Sjogren's syndrome, the sicker symptoms are much more higher in Sjogren's syndrome as compared to uh, to um, IgG4 disease. Only thing is that IgG4 disease presents with a lot of uh, the marked increase in allergic rhinitis and also interstitial nephritis in IgG4 disease as compared to patients with Sjogren's syndrome. And obviously, as if a patient presents with autoimmune pancreatitis and you have the classical sausage shape uh, pancreatitis, the sausage shape of the pancreas again suspect IgG4 disease rather than Sjogren's syndrome. What about the labs? In the labs, what do you see? Uh, you've sent the labs, and what are you? What are the problems that you anticipate? So one is anemia, which is often seen in many of the rheumatological conditions. Anemia of chronic disease seen in about 25% of the patients. But on top of that, you can have hemodilution occurring and anemia occurring due to hemodilution due to the polyclonal hypergammaglobinemia, which is often found in these patients with Sjogren's syndrome. Leukopenia, which is seen in about 30% of the patients, often can drop to around 3,000. Now, if you have a patient with Sjogren's syndrome with counts dropping less than 3,000 and definitely less than 2,500, it's an indication for doing getting a bone marrow done for this patient and doing a, a significant evaluation for an underlying malignancy in these patients or looking for other causes for uh, drug-induced or other causes for leukopenia. Thrombocytopenia has, can also occur in patients with Sjogren syndrome. Now, like I said, total globulins as such, uh, hyperglobulinemia is seen in about 80% of the patients, particularly IgG is often seen. And if a hypergammaglobulinemia exists in a patient with Sjogren syndrome, please work up for lymphoma. The other things that um, I uh, kind of I'm just brushing through our other things that you need to see is um, basic metabolic panel. Particularly, these patients can have features, like I said, of uh, type 1 renal tubular acidosis. You can have hyperkalemia in these patients. Some of these patients presenting with a hyperkalemic periodic paralysis also. Urine analysis, uh, proteinuria and or hematuria, glomerulonephritis is often seen in such patients. Mild um, proteinuria, hyposthenuria, all suggestive of renal tubular acidosis. And then you do the autoantibodies. I would recommend uh, that 
probably one of if you are taking a carry home message and if you are um, suspecting Sjogren's syndrome in a patient, please don't waste the patient's money by doing both SSA and SSB for these patients. Mostly, rheumatoid la, I mean the row antibody that is SSA is often positive in about 60% of the patients and majority of these patients will have a LA positive. Less than 5%, that's what they have shown in the trials of patients with Sjogren's have um, just LA positivity. So that you're not missing out on anything unless and until you have a strong suspicion, you, have, doesn't have, you don't have anything on biopsy, you can exclude doing LA antibodies for just for if you're just for diagnostic purposes. But in case SSA comes positive, then obviously you can do a LA as well for prognostication. ANE is often seen in about 85% of the patients. You can have low complements in about 5 to 10% of the patients. Rheumatoid factor positivity, particularly in high titers. So there are very few conditions which can cause rheumatoid factor positivity in high titers. Uh, one is Sjogren's syndrome. The other one is ankle vasculitis, cryoglobinemia, and rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, in a secondary sicker, 98% of these patients often have rheumatoid factor positivity. ACPA can also be positive. I haven't put in the percentages. Why? Because it varied from trials to trials. So somewhere around one to some going up to 10%. And but the thing is, it tend it basically shows these patients tend to have more of articular involvement. Now there is a subset of patients with Sjogren's syndrome who have who don't have the Rho and the La antibody, and they are come positive for CNP, an anti syndromia antibody. The ANA will show a classical star dot, a dotted pattern or multiple starry sky pattern is what we see a classical centromere pattern is what you see what is the difference between those patients who are anti centromere positive and not anti centromere positive they have a higher prevalence of Reynolds phenomena and dysphagia in this subset of patients as compared to those who are negative when you have a lower prevalence of dry eyes hypergammaglobinemia and even the antibodies in those who are um, as compared to those who are negative the other autoantibodies which are not used, generally used, are alpha fondrin, uh, carbonic anhydrase, muscarinic receptor antibodies, aquaporin antibodies, and the anti salivary gland protein one. These are not used for the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis and often used to um, when you are suspecting any associated condition, is when you can use aquaporin antibodies. But other than for that, alpha fondrin, carbonic anhydrase, all are purely on research basis till date. Now, how do you establish the diagnosis? So um, for a, establishing the diagnosis, you need a lip biopsy. And the lip biopsy classically shows a key histological feature of a focal lymphocytic cyanitis. But wherein, uh, what the pathologist does is they look for a focal score, which is basically an aggregate of lymphocytes seen in a surface area of four millimeters square. And if the focal score is more than one, then they basically score it and they grade it from grade three to grade four. And depending upon the inflammation, you have gradings grade going from zero, one, two, three, and four. Three and four is basically taken as Sjogren's, one and two is just taken as chronic cyanitis. This has a specificity of 83.5, uh, sorry, sensitivity of 83.5% and a specificity roughly coming up to 82%. So, how do you go about measuring disease activity and treating these patients with Sjogren's syndrome? Now, there are uh, several disease activity scores, uh, three important ones being these ones which I've enumerated, but what is currently being used and which is quite popular and being enforced into the current 2016 ACI ULAR classification criteria for Sjogren's syndrome is what is called as the ESS die. That's a ULAR Sjogren's syndrome disease activity index. Now, this occurs, this basically has 12 organ specific domains. It's a huge form, that's why I didn't put up. Um, it's predominantly clinical, having two lab parameters that are two lab organ systems, one is hematological, and the other one is what they've called as biological, wherein they have put in uh, clonal components, serum complements, serum IgG, and cryoglobulins in that. Now, um, the other thing that we can do when the patient comes on follow-up, other than for the ESS dye, which measures the disease activity, uh, is another index, which is a patient-reported index, and very simple. It hardly takes a minute. You just have to ask patients three questions. That is, the extent of dryness that they had over the last two weeks, the extent of fatigue that they had over the last two, um, 
two weeks and also the extent of joint pains or limb pain is basically what they say for the last two weeks and this is basically a subjective assessment for uh, the Sjogren's progression or regression or response to treatment. So that brings us to the classification criteria. Now, uh, classification criteria have evolved over time and still even now taken as, a, a, why I put this slide is basically even now considered to be a gold standard classification as the 2002 AECG criteria. From that has evolved the 2012 ACI criteria and the current, the present 2016 ACI EULA criteria. Now, what does the ACI EULA criteria have and why do we have uh, two criteria in a span of four years is basically uh, they've put in an inclusion criteria. So if they've taken the inclusion from the ACG criteria, that is six questions on ocular and uh, oral sicker, and they have modified the exclusion criteria to in, and they have any patient with history of head and neck treatment, acute hepatitis, AIDS, sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, graft versus disease, and IgG4 disease have to be excluded and cannot be classified as Sjogren's syndrome. If a patient has a weight score, and uh, this is a weighted score, the weight, uh, the weight, the rate of weights being given of three given for the salivary label, labial gland uh, biopsy feature of focal lymphocytic cytokinetics of more than or equal to one, that is grade three and above, or the presence of the antibodies. So here the weightage again, and that is why I said focus is on SSA, and that is why please don't waste the patient's money by doing SSB. SSA is all that's enough if for if for the diagnosis purpose at least. Uh, the other things that have been uh, in, included in the classification criteria is an objective um, measurement of the dryness, the ocular dryness by what is called as the ocular staining score and the Van Bezitzwald score. I'll just, I've not put up what the scoring systems are, but what you need to know is basically two dyes are used. You have the fluorescein and you have the lysamine green, which are basically being used. Schirmer's test of less than five millimeter in just even one eye is sufficient to satisfy the criteria or even a unsimulated whole salivary flow rate of less than or equal to one ml per minute. This criteria has a sensitivity of 96% uh, and a specificity of 95%. So um, you have a patient, you have diagnosed a patient, and so how do you go about treating the patient? So treatment for uh, Sjogren's syndrome, several recommendations have come, but this current 2020 recommendations have basically pulled in all the evidences, and I personally feel it's a very good recommendation for treating patients with Sjogren's syndrome. They've, um, they have basically uh, said that Symptomatic relief using topical is basically what you need for the dryness and systemic therapies should only be considered in for treatment of active systemic diseases. So uh, I'll just briefly show you a couple of uh, these last few slides of mine, which are basically uh, briefing about the treatment. Um, you have, you you can, the ULAR 2020 recommendations are freely available. You can, and any problem you can contact me, I'll, I'll be glad to help you with the doubts. But uh, what has generally been seen is that for a patient who presents with oral dryness, how to approach is you have to do an unstimulated whole salivary flow measurement in these patients. Unfortunately, it's uh, not something that we do in our, our practice regularly. And once you establish that this patient has sicka, that is less than 0.1 ml per minute, you do a stimulated whole salivary flow measurement and divide the patient into normal, moderate, and severe. Now, for normal and moderate dysfunction, non-pharmacological stimulation is more than enough. Giving them chewing gums, non-sweetened uh, chewing gums particularly, is lozenges. All these things can be provided for the patients and for as non-pharmacological stimulation, along with which you have to provide stim uh, pharmacological stimulation if there are no response or there is intolerance to that, or if the patient develops frequent dental caries. Pharmacologic stimulation, I'll come to that. Two drugs which have been established as muscarinic agents like pilocarpin and civimelin. Civimelin is not available here. We have pilocarpin which is available outside. Now, if a patient doesn't have any stimulus, uh, don't have any, doesn't have any response to the pharmacological stimulation, 
rescue therapies are available. You can use mucolytics like NAC or cholinergics, and also electrostimulation can also be provided for these patients. But all these two, the last two things, are purely experimental and uh, probably on research basis. Salivary substitutes have also been been uh, probably it is the first treatment of choice for patients with severe dysfunction. And I'll just come to what is the salivary substitute uh, that needs to be that ought to be prescribed. Ocular dryness, you have to do the uh, the ocular staining score, which I just mentioned a couple of uh, slides back. So the ocular uh, staining score is, uh, if it is less than five, you do something else called as the OSC or the OSDI, which I'll come to later on. And uh, basically cut the number of, uh, this is basically on a very typical thorough approach, but if not, if it is not very severe, it's non-severe catoconjunctivitis sicker, you have to treat these patients with artificial tears and probably at the night giving them tear ointments to be used at night. Now, in, in severe catoconjunctivitis sicker, if the patient doesn't respond to artificial tears and ointments, topical glucocorticosteroids have to be given, but to a very short period of time, probably two to four weeks is all that's enough. Patient not responding to this, topical cyclosporin or even ceramide uh, drops, autologous ceramide drops have also been tried and probably as rescue therapies, oral muscanate or even plug insertions can be given for these patients. Now, um, I'll just, uh, this, this is basically the ocular surface disease index. It's a couple of, it's a couple of questions which are there and depending on this, you decide on how to go about treatment of these patients. But what is important is the last line I've put in this in this slide, it's acute steroids, immunosuppressants, uh, steroids, I mean, is oral steroids, immunosuppressants and rituximab are not recommended for oral or ocular dryness. So if you have a patient who just presents with sicker symptoms, you have to treat them for the sicker and not with any of the, uh, the conventional synthetic demands or with steroids or with biologicals. Um, Regarding the salivary dysfunction, what salivary substitute? Neutral pH sodium fluoride gels are basically what is recommended. So even if the sprays which have been given, it's better to have a little bit of fluoride in them. And uh, for the ocular dryness, artificial tears containing methyl cellulose or hyaluronate is what is recommended. For the musculoskeletal pain, um, HCQ has moderate evidence. Rituximab uh, is not generally given, but off-label use of rituximab has been given, but it's not currently warranted. Opioids should be avoided in these patients. Now, uh, quickly just running over through uh, the last two slides of mine, and uh, I'll just tell you how to manage some of the problems uh, which these patients with Sjogren's syndrome press in, and often that is the cutaneous manifestations. These patients press in with annular erythema, limited Anilerthema, you can treat it with topical steroids, but if it's a diffuse, HCQ is indicated for these patients and probably even add on another anti-malarials if they are not responding to it. Like for example, quinacrine is something that has been used in the Western countries with or without low corticosteroids. Now, what needs a little more aggressive treatment would be the cutaneous vasculitis, which these patients complain of and are quite terrible uh, to treat also. If these patients have a moderate ESS dye, you can just treat them with glucocorticoids. steroids. But if they have a high, gluco, uh, high ESS dye, that means they're going into ulceration also, then along with the glucocorticoid steroids, often uh, these patients are given oral immunosuppressants or even rituximab is a very good op option for treatment, treating of these cutaneous uh, vasculitis. And if severe, causing severe ulcerations, ischemia, cyclophosphamide even to extent of plexing, can be offered to such patients. What about the pulmonary involvement? If it's just bronchial involvement, inhaled treatment is all that's required. But if it's interstitial lung disease, primarily, predominantly glucocorticosteroids, we do give uh, immunosuppressants upfront to most of our patients. Uh, those patients resistant, cyclophosphamide or rituximab have to be given to these patients. Renal involvement, uh, tubular involvement, and glomerular nephritis tubular involvement, you just treat it symptomatically. But if there is a moderate ESS dye, so everything is on the disease activity index, you have to treat these patients with glucocorticosteroids or immunosuppressants, and even probably very severe, think in terms of rituximab or cyclophosphamide. 
Uh, peripheral neuropathy also in the same line. You have to treat these patients um, with polyneuritis, with glucocorticosteroids or immunosuppressants. And those patients present with CIDP or ganglionopathies, IVIG should be the treatment of choice initially before you try other regimens. CNS involvement. Now, this is a very troublesome um, problem to tackle, particularly the neuromyelitis optica spectrum diseases, which is often seen in these patients. Um, glucocorticosteroids and cyclophosphamide have to be provided upfront. Rescue therapies with rituximab or with or without plexing or even eculizumab, that is a complement five uh, inhibitors and monoclonal antibodies are also being used for the treatment of CNS, vasculitis and uh, NMO spectrum disease. There is a school of thought of giving rituximab even before glucocorticosteroids in this particular subset of patients. The other, other uh, same thing like for uh, uh, MS-like disease and even lymphocytic meningitis. Now, like I told you earlier on, lymphopenia is a problem. Leukopenia is a problem with some of these patients. So unless and until the neutrophils are, are less than 500, intervention is not required. But if the patient is, is, has neutropenic count, has neutropenic and it's less than 500, we have to treat it with uh, GCSF. Thrombocytopenia, less than uh, 20,000 or hemoglobin, less than eight, between eight to 10 percent glucocorticosteroids. And if there's severe hemolysis, have to treat it like an aggressive hemolytic anemia. Now, this is my last slide and I'm, I'm stopping with this. And this is something that um, we have seen. And uh, unfortunately, some of the patients have been, um, have been uh, probably not treated correctly. And this is often some of the referrals which might come to you also, that a patient in the Sjogren's syndrome group pregnant, row positive, how do you go about managing this patient? So um, if uh, it is very mandated, it is a mandatory thing that these patients have to undergo fetal echo and fetal monitoring for complete heart blocks or any of the heart blocks between 16 and 26 weeks of gestation and make sure that these patients are on HCQ. Now, if you find that the patient has a complete heart block, is it an incomplete heart block? Is it a first degree, second degree, or a third degree heart block? If it is a first degree heart block or even a second degree heart block, please treat the patient, start on the patient with on a fluorinated glucocorticosteroid. Dexamethasone, four milligram OD, uh, four to six milligram, depending upon the patient, four milligram would suffice. Okay, and an echo has to be repeated and seen whether there is reversion of the things. And fluorinated hydrocarbons, uh, glu glucocorticosteroids have to be continued. Now, um, IVIG has been included in this uh, particular recommendation, but um, there is a lot of negative data, data against the use of IVIG. So we don't use IVIG for treating patients with complete heart block. And if at all a patient de develops a third degree heart block, please continue the fluorinated uh, glucocorticosteroids for whatever it's worth. And once a baby is born, then probably consider a pacemaker implantation in this patient. Uh, with that, I'll end my talk. Um, if there are any questions, I can take them. Thank you so much, sir, for your excellent lecture. We are grateful to you for the time and effort you took to share your thoughts and experience. If anyone has any doubts, kindly put it in the chat box. Yeah, uh, yeah. Th th that particular question of uh, whether undifferentiated arthritis does have, um, yeah. So um, that's why I said like undifferentiated arthritis, it depends on when you are uh, uh, seeing this particular patient. So if the patient is beyond 12 uh, months, then um, extraarticular manifestations have to be looked for in these patients. You have to look for, you have to take an x-ray at minimum do a urine routine, uh, probably look for proteins in the urine, look for um, RBCs, cast in this particular patient. But 
um, usually in very early, uh, this thing is very unlikely for patients to have extraarticular manifestations. Uh, role of HCQ, yeah. So uh, that's why I said uh, most of us, um, even us, we used to give HCQ in um, undifferentiated connective tissue diseases. Um, for undifferentiated connective tissue disease, yes, uh, probably HCQ may be an indicator. But if the patient's predominant symptom is an inflammatory arthritis, then uh, I would say please start the patient on methotrexate. Evidence is there for that, and methotrexate does. Uh, prevent the progression of this patient into a full-fledged arthritis and developing erosions. So um, our aim as a physician would be to prevent the cartilage loss, which is occurring in those patients. So what you need to do or to do, HCQ is a very mild agent, so won't uh, be sufficient for to treat such inflammatory process. And so there, probably a single agent, methotrexate would suffice in that patient. I don't know. Stopping treatment for US, huh? Yeah. Um, again, like, uh, see, uh, again, depends upon the patient. Yeah. So, what I would, what we generally practice is we keep the patient on follow up and we tell them two years of treatment. So, in two years, uh, inflammatory markers are normal, everything uh, is negative. We don't generally repeat um, the antibodies, we don't look at the titer of rheumatoid factor also. So if the patient's symptom is negative, then yes, uh, we slowly do taper and we do stop the uh, methotrexate or the single agent which the patient is on. Now, if the patient has ACPA positivity, then it's a it's a different uh, ball game altogether. Currently, we are some of the some of us are doing ultrasounds, MRI to look for um, to look for early damage in such patients. So depending upon whether then on a case-to-case -case basis, not a guideline, on a case-to-case -case basis, you can decide on when to start the patient. But uh, preferably give it some time. Two years would be a good time, yeah. So if the serologies are negative for the first time, then yeah. when we are monitoring, do we need to repeat them because there's a chance yeah. of- so, the Yeah, there's part. a chance. So that is what, so if the patient recruits any new symptom or you are, uh, you, then yes, probably repeating may make sense. But if you have a positive city and then looking for drop in titers doesn't make sense. And it's not warranted. It's not actually put up in any particular guideline. Negative, we might need to look for if there are symptoms, new symptoms. Yes, and, yes. and that is why keeping such patients under, in, under your close follow-up is very, very important. Any more doubts? This lecture will soon be uploaded in YouTube channel in CMC Velo Department of Medicine website. Uh, if there are no more doubts, then we'll wind up for today. Thank you so much, sir, for taking the lecture for us. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.